Dell's got a massive 49 inch monitor, a sweet pocket translator that doesn't live on your phone. Pour one out for Camel Camel Camel's hard drives, TV picks for gamers and more all coming up on Tech Thing. Thank you, patrons. Without your support via patreon.com slash techthing, we could make the show for you each and every week. Join the crew that makes Tech Thing possible at patreon.com slash techthing. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patty Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we have something useful in every single show. Oh my goodness. It's been several minutes. I don't, did we remind minutes. people to back up? <laughs> well, it seems like somebody was- Not in today's to episode. Oh my goodness, somebody somebody said to me a while back, they're like, you remind people to back up like every 15 minutes. I'm well, like, it's important. It is. <laughs> and then we were thinking about that because uh, the ever so awesome price tracking service, Camel Camel Camel, had a really bad week last week. Um, we use it for tracking prices on Amazon. Yeah. And I think about that because I should have used Camel 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 the other day because I was looking at four terabyte reds and I didn't realize that the $87 price they were listed at at Amazon was $40 under the regular price. Whoa. Should have bought those drives that day. Oh, man. Um, but <laughs> in the words of viewer Don, here's a good reason to back up that data, $29,000 for data recovery. Of course, they had a backup, just not as you would expect, up to date. So if you go up to camelcamelcamel.com, they are temporarily oh, unavailable. No. They have a 503 failure. Uh, on the evening of Saturday, January 26, our database server had three hard drives fail. It was designed to handle two disk failures, but three failed disks made the situation catastrophic. Oh, no. Um, so they're offline for a few more days. Uh, by the end of this that week, they stinks. should be. Yeah, it's horrible, actually. Yeah. Um, because, again, you know, prices, checking, That's, useful. Yes. <laughs> um, I suspect, Don, though, they have such a huge volume of data uh, that you know, paying for online backup uh, would be prohibitively expensive or mm -hmm. seem prohibitively expensive before they had to recover the data from multiple dead drives. Um, and like they said, they had parity data for two drive failures, but a third drive failure wiped the whole thing out. And when you look at the breakdown on this, this is... Uh, oh, geez. Well, so the drives are so old and they're all the same age, so they decided to replace all 12 of the disks plus two backups. That's $14,860.79. Oh, my goodness. So those are probably like enterprise SAS drives yeah, or something like that. Yeah, they must be. Um, the data recovery tab, $29,726.41 for a grand total of $44,587.20. Ah, uh, ouch. So, Ooh, you know. that's painful. That is painful. Oh, man. <laughs> that is really painful. <sighs> um, you know, it sucks. I hope they get back online soon. And hey, just a perfect reminder, if you haven't backed up your data, go back up your data yes. right now. <laughs> uh, because, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, that's it. That's a lot of dollar bills right there. That's, and, and oh my goodness, and uh, it just, that's probably really mellow. I mean, think about the hospitals that were hit mm -hmm. with the ransomware viruses yeah. that locked down. Yeah, that was tough. All of their databases and stuff. Off-site copy. Very important. Three copies on at least two different mediums, at least <laughs> one off-site, three yes. to one backups, people, please. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, so, <laughs> my wife came home the other day and she's like, what's with the coffin? The coffin? The coffin. Um, okay. So, if you ask me what the biggest challenge of 2019 has been so far, not CES, it was actually getting Dell's ultra sharp 49 inch curved monitor out of the box. Oh, yes. And onto my kitchen table. That monster. Okay, so it weighs 58 pounds. It's okay. 49 inches diagonally. Okay. It is literally a good four feet wide horizontally. Wider than my admittedly kind of tweed desk. It's insane. It is insane. It this is, is the one that they were showing off at their uh, event space mm -hmm. at CES and the thing is just huge. Usually you walk by a monitor and you know, it's not like walking, you know, you walk down a city block and, and, and you know, you, you're kind of <laughs> like. Are we comparing the monitor to a city block well, now? Well, you just, well, you know, when you can count to like two or three by the time you walk from, you know, walk past the monitor. Yeah. I'm exaggerating, but it's as, almost as wide as my kitchen table, which is not a particularly twee kitchen table. Oh my goodness. I think I've actually found an ultra wide monitor that is 
too ultra wide for me. Wow. Um, it's also probably the first time I've ever thought a tighter radius uh, might have been a good call mm. for a monitor. Mm -hmm. The curve of a curved monitor, such as my beloved Dell U3415, paid for it myself, is defined uh, by the radius in millimeters. Mm -hmm. So a 3415 is fairly shadow uh, by curved monitor standards. They call it 3800R or a 3800 millimeter radius. That's 3.8 meters. Basically draw a circle with a 12.4 uh, foot radius or a 24 point, 24 point eight foot diameter um, and the curve of the monitor would match the curve of that giant circle. Okay. U4919 is also 3800R, the same radius as my 15 inch smaller diagonally monitor. Um, so when I was trying to use the whole monitor at once, there is a little bit of that tennis match effect going on <laughs> um, because it's really wild. Not so bad on something like Rocket League, mm -hmm. um, but on stuff where you need to pay attention to the corners, it's important. And I should point out, this Dell is more for productivity uh, or you know creatives. Um, I can definitely imagine like using that for editing. Yes. It was interesting, right? Because mm -hmm. gaming monitors, they tend to they go for that tight radius, we're going to wrap around your head like goggles feel, which is great. Uh, for having it, you know, the, it's it's wrapped around me. Yeah. I'm gaming. Yeah. Um, not so great when you're working on a giant spreadsheet uh, or in Photoshop, and you realize that all of your horizontal lines look curved. Right. That's <laughs> the weird sort of visual side effect when you right. have a very tight radius on a monitor. Mm -hmm. um, so literally, I'm this monitor, which is uh, you know about like this, give <laughs> or take. Um, you know, if I put a spreadsheet so that column A row one was all the way in the upper left hand corner. Yeah. Um, it, it was really far away, <laughs> you know. Um, as in like I didn't need binoculars, but it's certainly that joke passed my mind at least once. Well what if you just stick everything in the middle? If you stick everything in the middle and use the far left and right for minor things, say status updates or you know those those crazy, you know if you have like all of your the far right and the far left is like signals over here. Like I could run my spider out back up in the background. Exactly. Or, or run my hand breaking and codes in the background. Yeah. The stuff you don't necessarily have to pay attention to all the time. Yeah, I mean I was thinking I have a friend of mine who has this crazy detailed sort of 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 it's all the meters for all the servers he's oh, responsible yeah. for. Yeah. And you know, they kind of flash red if all hell breaks loose. That would be good for the far right and left of this monitor. I could see a little bit of curvature in terms of things like a spreadsheet, you mm -hmm. know, because spreadsheets are generally straight lines. Um, <laughs> uh, but it was pretty gentle compared to other monitors. Overall, uh, it's 32 by 9, um, looked really, really good. Uh, 5,120 by 1,440 pixels. It gives it a pixel density of 109 pixels per inch, which sounds really poor compared to a phone. But it actually looked really good, especially compared to some of the other 49's gaming monitors. Uh, for example, Samsung's CHG90, much lower resolution, 3840 by 1080. But then again, a gaming monitor, if they go for higher frame rates, like 144 hertz, instead of the 4919DW60 hertz. Less uh, hot spotting or backlighting. The backlighting seemed really consistent. That's good. And something that somebody would kind of was like, check the backlighting because it can be a really pro. It, it's when you have a massive. It could probably change, right? Yeah. So it's edge lit, which means you know the the, the lights are coming from the side. Mm -hmm. They don't have a whole bunch of LEDs behind it. Um, but I didn't see any particularly brutal hot spotting on this. This was also a hand selected sample that they sent out through the reviews department. Gaming at 5120 by 1440, I have no idea if there's an abbreviation for that. Uh, at 60 hertz, <laughs> it worked fine. Uh, I have a GTX 1070. I would probably want a bigger, badder GPU if I was doing something more taxing than Rocket League mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Yeah. But it did that massive resolution at high settings and it looked good. Once I get that 2080 built, <laughs> I would love to play Tomb Raider on this ultra wide, extra wide, like super basic monitor. Um, <laughs> you know, it was, it was good. I, 144 frames per second would be nice. Yeah. FreeSync would, be, 60 nice. Hertz is would fine. be nice. 60 hertz is fine for most things. Um, so I gotta say, mm -hmm. This monitor is too big for any available workspace I have. It is really wide. It Same. is four feet wide. I'm really glad um, you reviewed it and I didn't. <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> I mean, I actually got a second pair of hands to help me put it up because yeah. I didn't want to. You wanna, would need to. Well, also it's just, it's embarrassing to drop a monitor and expensive. Yeah, you, you don't um, want to do that. <laughs> so my eyes are just old enough that looking to the far corners was a bit more than I wanted to deal with because mm -hmm. uh, I have to use reading glasses for the stuff that's this far out. 
Uh, but if you want to replace a collection of desktop monitors that you have filled edge to edge with windows full of data uh, and you're more into resolution than refresh rates, the U49 19DW, very, very tempting. Um, personally, I think ultra wides are easier to use on a desktop than a regular 16 by 9 4K television yeah. monitors. Um, though the ultra wide monitors are going to be more expensive because mm -hmm. they produce a lot less glass in that size. Right. So this monitor, uh, the uh, 49 inch Dell, Thirteen forty nine currently, though it lists for a dollar under seventeen hundred, so sixteen ninety nine point something. Okay. <laughs> so thirteen forty nine for this monitor, expensive, but you know you're getting a lot of monitor. <laughs> you're yes. literally getting a lot of monitor. A slew of monitor. A slew of monitor. <laughs> if you're looking for a more reasonable monitor, or you want me to do an eval, really, really get deep on the idea of using a four K HDTV on a desktop. Do us a favor, email ask at techthing.com. We're listening. <laughs> that was Japanese. For where is the train station? Yeah, eki wa doko desu ka. That was correct. <laughs> so is this a pocket-sized translator? It is. Yeah, it's by Source Next. It's mm -hmm. called the Pocket Talk. Uh, you can find one of these little guys over at pockettalk.net. Uh, basically, yeah, it's a little pocket-sized translator that can translate 74 different languages over Whoa. a Wi-Fi, a mobile plan, or a personal hotspot. So you could connect this to your phone if you wanted to. Uh, the interesting thing about this, and compared to some of the other translators I've seen on the market coming out in the previous couple of years, is that this one is fully connected. So you have the SIM card option, Wi-Fi, you also have Bluetooth, so you could connect this to like a, an external speaker if you're teaching a class. So this won't, it basically, because people are like, everybody wants a babble fish, right? You stuff uh, yes, the thing yes, in your ear true. and you understand all languages. Yeah. But it's because it, it, with most things, it, like everything else, this requires a <laughs> well. I just, it, it does always, require a connection. Yes. That. So basically, yep. if you have no connection to the internet, this won't translate. Right. Okay. Yep. You got that right. Okay. Now this can be used with a global SIM card if you want to from Pocket Talk, or you can just buy your own SIM card wherever you're going. Uh, but you can also purchase a two-year plan with the SIM card that they have. That option. Uh, that's the one that I have, and it's two hundred and ninety-nine dollars. Mm -hmm. They do have the separate option, which has an add your own SIM card after the fact, and that one's two hundred forty-nine dollars. But they do also have this nice little sweet bundle, which is basically the same thing as the SIM card included bundle for $299, but you also get a free screen protector and a lanyard. So I feel like that one's a pretty good deal if you wanted to go out and purchase one of these things. Now the nice thing about this is it works on 3G and 4G, LTE, CDMA, it has Bluetooth 4.0 like I mentioned, so it, like if you're teaching a class about translations, mm -hmm. you could set this up with an external speaker so everybody can hear it. Oh, cool. Uh, and it also works with Wi-Fi 2.4 and 5 gigahertz too, so you can use it with a hotspot. It runs on Android 8.1, but they have their own custom UI, which works with this interface. Uh, it's kind of a pain in the butt to type in your Wi-Fi password whenever you first set it up because the keyboard is so tiny on the screen. <laughs> and it's a 2.4 inch low res screen. It's 320 by 240 pixels per inch. So it's very, very small Sounds resolution. Sounds like some audio players I've done where you're yeah, like... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But you don't really need a high resolution on something like this. You're not playing video. Yeah. All you're doing is looking at text. I'm just thinking more of like the, the typing in the passwords. It's yeah. just a pain in the posterior. And it's just that one time that you type in the password, but after that, everything is just touch and go. Uh, it charges by USB type C, which is great, and it's a 2200 milliampere battery. It does charge pretty quickly. Out of the box, it was at like 75% mm -hmm. charged already, and then it hit about 100% after just about 30 minutes. And you can put it into sleep by pressing on the little power button on the side, which turns off the screen. Uh, that will save power for a very long time. By doing this, it dropped to from 100% to 99% the next morning for me overnight. So it sleeps so, well. Yay, it sleeps very well. Does it consume a lot of battery when you're translating? No, it really doesn't. Okay. Like, I've been using it all this morning, and let's see what I'm currently on. I'm on 96%. Okay. So that's after like maybe two hours of use or so. So I could use this for a few days without it actually dying, which is wonderful. <laughs> uh, booting it up does take a long time. 
it takes quite a long time because it's running on a pretty slow processor. So I would just suggest leaving it in sleep mode <laughs> whenever it's not in use, and then you can just press one of the buttons on the front to wake the thing up. And then it weighs 3.5 ounces. It's very small, so you can just stick this in your pocket and get up and go to whatever country you're going to. The idea of putting it on the bundled lanyard just yeah. terrifies me. The lanyard <laughs> thing sounds so touristy to me. <laughs> it sounds like you, you, you've gone I on don't tours, like to I'm sure, where you have to wear a translator. <laughs> on a lanyard, I have. I've in been a museum, on one of those in Germany. It doesn't Germany. bother me, but but <laughs> like walking on the street, the idea of giving people a handle to yank things yeah. from me, just, <laughs> not so much. So you're probably wondering how it works. Uh, well, it has several different working like home languages that work for the system. That includes English, German, Italian, Spanish, French, Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. So those are just for like getting through the menu and all that stuff. And then for translations, all those it comes with 74 to choose from, including Japanese. Spanish, Arabic, Greek, Hawaiian is in there, etc., etc. There's a bunch to choose from. Now, the ones that are included, the 74 that I said, this is described as languages that can be activated via voice input. Now, what I mean by that is there are several other languages available inside of this, like, like New Zealand's Maori is in there, uh, but they just show you a readout on the screen and only a one-way translation. So they don't actually get voice activated whenever you try to translate those. It can just translate whatever your English text is on the screen. So you don't actually hear it. I have to type, do I talk to it? And you talk it, to it. And then it puts out on a, the Maori on the screen and then I hold it up to the person? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's it. And it won't actually like speak it out loud. And then the person who is speaking the other language, they won't be able to speak back to you. Unless it's one of those 74 that's included that can do the both ways. Uh, the, the translation both ways. Okay. Does that make sense? Kind of. Okay, I'll give you a demo. Now it does receive over the air updates as well to add new languages, so over time you'll see a lot more added, but right now we have those 74 to work with, plus the ones that don't do both ways translations. So for this demo, I know mostly Japanese, so I'll do that, uh, but I'll give you a couple of other examples. So we already heard, where's the train station? I could ask, um, can I order a beer please? That sounded correct to me. Okay. Um, and then back I could say, I love you. I love you. Yeah, I got it right. right. <laughs> now, if I want to, I could change this to, let's try Korean. I only know one word in Korean, so I'm going to try this. It might, it, might, it might not work. Onyohaseyo. Mm. Anya Haseo. Hi. Okay, that one worked. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of words for hi. I know, right? A lot of letters, <laughs> I should say. Um, give me another one. What, what else should I try on here? <laughs> more kimchi, please. More kimchi? <laughs> I don't know uh, any more. Well, I'd, I wouldn't be able to tell you if it was correct or not. <laughs> When Certainly it translated. somebody in the audience could. Well, I okay. could try. But you were talking with Jason earlier, who yes. grew up speaking German. Oh, yeah. And that actually worked out pretty well or not so well? It did work well, yeah. Um, with German, the only thing I know is how to order a beer. <laughs> beer, bitte. Beer, please. Okay, that one worked. <laughs> beer, please. My name is Super Roboter. My name is Super Robot. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Rainbow Unicorn. Ich heiße Rainbow Unicorn. Hast du frischen Kaffee gemacht? Did you make fresh coffee? <laughs> No, I did not make fresh coffee, sorry. Nein, ich habe keinen frischen Kaffee gemacht. Is that right? <laughs> Wie soll ich denn jetzt bitte wach bleiben? <laughs> How am I supposed to stay awake now? <laughs> <laughs> now, if I do want to translate something like Maori, um, I say that because I just got back to New Zealand. I apologize because I don't get the translation correct. I don't say it right. Mm -hmm. But 
if I choose to tr uh, try to translate something into te reo meori, uh, then I would say um, for English, hello, koa. So it just gives me the translation on the screen, but it doesn't actually speak it out. Now, if I try to press the button to translate something from Maori to English, it's going to tell me language is not supported. So I Got can't it. I can't have a Maori person speak back to me and mm -hmm. then get that translation in English. Uh, now, I did have a few areas of concern th when I was going through testing this. Uh, the Pocket Talk does save a history of your translations on the company servers uh, on a site called pockettalkcenter.com. And if you're curious what that looks like, I have logged into my account over here. And it's basically just a list of all of your translations. <laughs> uh, these are saved on your device as well as in this pockettalkcenter.com. Uh, but you can go into to the reset options menu and clear translation history. Now, this can be super useful for memorization if you are practicing a different language. Well, assuming you speak the kanji or, or the whatever's posted on yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, which I, I know some katakana and hiragana, so I can right. kind of figure out what that says. Uh, but I kind of prefer to delete them all from my memory. It will save up to 10,000 in a list that can be audibly read back to you. So if I look <laughs> back on here and there's something specific that I want to hear again, like, how are you? How are you? I can go back and listen to that, and then I can listen to listen to the Japanese translation. So you can go back and see all of your translations and listen to them again if language is supported. So it's those 74 languages again. Also, due to restrictions in China, if you're traveling in China, you can use China mode on here to still access the internet and get translations on the pocket top, but functionality might be a little limited. Now, here's the thing, too, and I'm sure everybody out there is thinking about Google Translate, right? Right. I am, too, because I own an Android. So if you have Google Translate on your phone, you don't necessarily need a Pocket Talk translator. But if you don't have access to things like Wi-Fi or maybe you have limited cell phone service on your phone internationally, then having an international SIM ready to go on a separate device, something with a battery that's going to last a lot longer that you can just pull out and have a conversation with somebody with, could be extremely helpful. So for me, this is an add-on. It wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. take the place of my phone, especially since I have Google Fi, sure. and that works pretty much in every country that I'm going to travel to. As of the last few weeks. As of the last <laughs> few weeks. Thank you, Google Fi. I appreciate you. Uh, but overall, I thought it was really cool to use. Mm -hmm. It was very fun, but it's an add-on for me. It's a perk as okay. opposed to something that I would just carry around by itself. There you have it. Yep, there you have it. So <laughs> let me know if you have any other translators that you would like me to check out uh, other than the Pocket Talk. I would love to check out more of them because I do travel a lot overseas. And finding a way to easily converse with people and make friends is something that is really important to me. And th I think this would be generally pretty helpful as long as it got my translations correct and wasn't trying to say, what was that that you said? Budai, not a husband. Well, in theory, Budai Fu is uh, no doctor. Oh, which is literally all I have of a year of Chinese left in my skull. I remember more Latin from high school. No doctor. Um, Interesting. But uh, it, it's a long story. <laughs> but uh, no, it, but it's 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 language is challenging. Dialects yes. are challenging. Yes. Um, one of the funniest conversations I ever had was someone from Germany who was used to traveling in sort of Philadelphia, the New York area, oh. and sort of getting used to those accents yeah. and then traveling to Texas and, yeah. and in a fairly rural part of Texas, and the accents were completely different. So, so you would probably have a lot better luck with this if mm -hmm. you were speaking English in China to somebody who was speaking Chinese you know, simplified Chinese back to you because their dialect would right. be correct, and this would probably pick it up a lot Because I can guarantee you my dialect is not correct. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think mine would be either. I mean, I can barely do like, I, I only know one word in, in, in Korean, like I mentioned, and it barely got that right, so. <laughs> oh my goodness, available now? Yes, it's available now. Um, I got to check this out at a press event quite recently, and they sent one over for me to review. I thought it was very cool, and I wanted to show it off on the show. So you can pick one up over at pockettalk. What was it? Pockettalk.net if you're interested. And again, comment below if you want me to review any other translators. Got something you want to share with the audience? Got a product you want to see us review? You heard us before, email ask at Tech Thing, or you can tweet at Snubs or at Patrick Norton, or hey, you can even tweet at Tech Thing. And a big shout out to our patrons, patreon.com slash Tech Thing. You pay the bills, you make the show possible. Our thanks to you. Join the crew that makes Tech Thing happen at patreon.com slash Tech Thing. Thank you so much 
for watching and supporting the show. We got an email from James over in Dallas, Texas. He says, if I run everything through a VPN, will I still be able to log into my bank, email, etc., or will they automatically think I am unauthorized? Thanks again from James, still in Dallas. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry, but I, lo I love Dallas. It's so fun down there. <laughs> Don't think it's what they sound like in Dallas. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Howdy. Sorry, too much. <laughs> <laughs> it was the New Zealish before the show that really made me laugh. <laughs> so, so, James, the answer to your question is, it's an absolute maybe. Uh, and That's it changes. Uh, except for, okay, so Netflix, for example, they are pretty much always going to shut down VPNs. Mm -hmm. um, they seem to have a really, I think there's a whole fleet of people at, at, at Netflix that just figure out what IP addresses they need to block to make sure pretty much all VPNs don't work with Netflix. My bank, though, refused to connect over VPNs, pound <sighs> stupid, uh, but now if I connect to my bank account through a VPN, it runs a sort of a, a, a two-factor authentication subroutine mm. that I don't normally see when I try to log in. And I'm okay with that, that actually works for me, because I think for a lot of services, they either figure you're trying to steal somebody's bank account or their PayPal account or their Amazon, and they get a little wonky about yeah. that. Um, and Especially if you're using a VPN that is connected to another country. Yeah. Like I use my, my Japanese VPN on PIA VPN all the time mm -hmm. because I like connecting to Japan servers and mm. setting up address and buying things over there. <laughs> but a lot of right. times if I, I have the same banking issue where I will log in and it'll be like, hold on, you're in a different country. Who are you? Let's send <laughs> you, you a 2FA code. You are terrible person trying yeah. to do evil but things. But I'm glad they're doing that just in case somebody from like internationally was right. trying to steal information from my US based bank. Because a VPN is a good way to hide your tracks on the internet. That's kind of the whole point. That's um, true. You can try using a different endpoint on your VPN. For example, if you're logged into Japan, switch back to the United States mm -hmm. and see if whatever website it is stops freaking out. Uh, and of course, you know, as Shannon pointed out with her Japanese shopping expeditions, uh, if you're trying to watch a sports <laughs> ball game or curling, uh, you might be using your VPN to GeoShift, which is kind of the whole point of that. But the problem is, is we can't test your bank and we can't test your favorite apps. And you could send us your password for your bank, that, but you shouldn't. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Please don't. Uh, I'm just, it's just liability I don't want in this universe or any other universe. But the, you know, the, literally the answer is it completely and totally depends and it will change over time. I'm just thankful that more businesses like, like for example, like I, my bank is pretty big, and yeah. for them to have a panic attack every time you use a VPN, it's like really. Yep. You got a lot of people, a lot of whom travel for business. That's Surely true. you could not panic about this. Uh, so that was a, that was a big day for me when I no longer <laughs> had to log out of my VPN to log into my bank. Pound. This is why I don't How use exciting. VPN any, or this. Uh, <laughs> just make yourself less secure so you can connect to the bank. I know, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Pound stupid. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I digress. Uh, let us know if you have any questions about VPNs. Uh, that's one of our favorite topics over here in TechThing land. Ask at TechThing.com or you can tweet either of us at Patrick Norton, at Snubs, or <laughs> at TechThing to answer all of your awesome questions. Apparently that's my excited Twitter face. <laughs> Not to be confused with That's going to be an fans. animated GIF now. That's a frightening thought. <laughs> we got an email from Thomas, who emailed ask at techthing.com. I am planning on downsizing my life and moving into a tiny home or an RV for full-time living. Go you. Mm -hmm. I am a big gamer, but because of the size limitations of an RV or a tiny home, I don't want a TV and then a monitor as well. Yes. I know that you can get TV tuners for your computer, but monitors are way more expensive than a TV. I want to get a 50 plus inch TV, would love 60 hertz plus, and would need enough inputs for my computer, Roku, PS4, PS3 at the very least, so four, but six HDMI inputs puts would be nice. And that was from Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Oh my goodness. So Thomas added in his email that he would also like composite inputs for his older consoles, Ooh. which is going to be really tough. Do, um, does anybody sell composites now? I mean, I guess you can get adapters. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a whole other segment for another day. I would also say don't, HDMI switches are so inexpensive at this point. Yeah. I wouldn't worry too much 
if the TV doesn't have six inputs, uh, because it's not that hard to get an HDMI switch. Switches are great. The rest of your list, though, is uh, pretty manageable. Um, so Robert Heron turned me on to this website, ratings.com, R-T-I-N-G-S.com, and they do some really, really good TV testing, especially looking at lag time, which seems to drive people uh, the most insane. Yeah. And fortunately, this is kind of cool. Most television manufacturers have realized that low lag makes for happy gamers, and there are a lot of gamers, therefore having low lag time and good gaming performance makes for better TV sales. Yeah. Yeah. So when uh, ratings, their picks for the best gaming TVs, if you look at this, it sounds a lot like some of the favorite TVs that Robert Heron and I have talked about here and on AVXL. It's like, oh look, an oh. LG OLED is their favorite pick because of the awesome color. Uh, Vizio P-Series Quantum, the Vizio P-Series. Um, it kind of goes on and on. And it, oh look, there's the TCL oh. R6.7. This, does this sound familiar? Very um, familiar. So. <laughs> I would, uh, you know, at the top end of that, it's like $1,500, $2,000, and then it kind of gets down to, I want to say it's $670 for, the, for TCL's it's television. That's not bad. Uh, something I totally forgot, Samsung's NU8000 does FreeSync, if you happen to have a FreeSync compatible card. Cool. I have not found out if the FreeSync, if, if NVIDIA FreeSync support will work with that monitor, mm. uh, and you'll need somebody with an NU8000 to find out. Um, Looking at that list though, I would skip OLED in case burn-in becomes a thing if you leave games running too long. But that Vizio P-Series and the TCL, they're really, really tempting. They come in 55-inch versions, which you should be able to sneak somewhere into your RV or your tiny home. <laughs> and I gotta say, it's so awesome to hear someone that wants to go for a bigger than 50-inch monitor in yes. a tiny home or an RV because it's nice to have that kind of cinematic experience. I also should point out that I have a 100-inch projector and screen in my house. Whoa. So to me, a 60 inch television looks tiny. <laughs> tiny, tiny, tiny. So. Well, we hope that helps, Thomas. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sending in the question. And of course, if you have any other questions that you would want to send our way, asketechthing.com is the place to do it. And a big thank you to Hack5 for sharing the studio space with us. Check out the security and privacy podcast at hack5.org. Then head over to c2.hack5.org to learn about Cloud C2, remote pen testing made easy. Deploy and manage fleets of Hack5 gear from a simple cloud dashboard. Check it out, people. It's good stuff. And remember, once in a while, put down your phone, step away from that screen, <laughs> turn off your Pocket Talk translator, and close your laptop and do something analog like Order Terry. Order your beer first. Order your beer first, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and do something analog like Terry who emailed askatechthing.com. For my analog project, my wife has an old fragile stained glass church window that she has owned for over 20 years. Whoa. I finally decided she deserved to have it preserved and displayed. Yes. The whole thing was very flimsy and the wood frame was beginning to crack and pull apart. So I cleaned it up. I made a frame to bolt onto the back to support the structure and added LED lights to give it an artificial glow. And he sent us a photo of this. He says, I also added a Google Home compatible switch so that it can be controlled by voice. It's now hanging in our living room and it's by far the happiest I've ever seen my wife. She was completely surprised. Enjoy from Terry. Terry, that's amazing and a serious question. What switch did you use with the Google Home? Because I kind of want to do a project similar to this. I think that's awesome. So cool. So, so cool and so beautiful. Way to go, Terry. Love it. And of course, if you have analog picks, send them over to us. I, I just want to give a shout out for getting it sort of secured and preserved before something terrible Amazing. happened. Amazing. Yeah. Because that's I it's it's I I've seen stuff that was laying around and yeah. somebody put a foot through it by accident or a basketball and it's just like no. <laughs> it's gorgeous. I'm glad she appreciates it and yeah. way to go. Yeah, that's very, very cool. So send your analog pics over to us. We would love to see them and share them and feature them in future episodes. Yay. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Shannon Morse. We'll see you next week on Tech Thing. I don't know what that bounce was about. <gasps> Tech Thing! Yeah! <laughs> Stomping on the floor. Sorry, basement dwellers. I'll take terrible 50s dances for a thousand. <laughs> or terrible. I think
One very cool thing that I saw, and the stained glass windows reminded me of it, was a very old, like 1800s cathedral in Dunedin, and they had these beautiful stained glass windows. Is Dunedin the town of New Zealand? Yes. Thank you. It is. <laughs> I guess context is important there, huh? I just check it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a. It was this gorgeous church that was in in New Zealand in the city, and. Oh my gosh, like they, they just let you go inside the cathedral and take photos if you want or just sit there and pray or whatever you need to do. Like it was very cool. I was cool. like St. John's in the line on 110th Street used to be open uh, 24 hours a day, which was really? a basic place to wow. walk to at 2 in the morning. Because yeah. also sometimes you'd walk in there and somebody would be like playing an instrument at 2 in the morning. Oh, and cool. So the, 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 whatever they the were reverberations. Playing, yeah. yeah.